Come, let thy voice be one with theirs. Shout with their shout of praise. See how the giant sun soars up, great Lord of years and days. So let the love of Jesus come and set the Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thought of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, Also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have built your church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Grant us so to be joined together in unity of spirit by their teaching, that we may be made a holy temple acceptable to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The first reading is a reading from the second book of Samuel, chapter 1, verses 1 and 17 through 27. After the death of Saul, when David had returned from defeating the Amalekites, David remained two days in Ziklag. David intoned this lamentation over Saul and his son Jonathan he ordered that the song of the bow be taught to the people of Judah. It is written in the book of Jashar. He said, Your glory, O Israel, lies slain upon your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath. Proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon, or the daughters of the Philistines will rejoice. The daughters of the uncircumcised will exult. You mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew or rain upon you, your bounteous fields. For there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul 
anointed with oil no more. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back, nor the sword of Saul return empty. Saul and Jonathan, beloved and lovely, in life and in death, they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. O daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you with crimson in luxury, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan lies slain upon your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother, Jonathan. Greatly beloved were you to me. Your love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen, and the weapons of war perished. The word of the Lord. Psalm 130. Out of the depths have I called to you, O Lord. Hear my voice. Let your ears consider well the voice of my supplication. If you, Lord, were to note what is done amiss, O Lord, who could stand? for there is forgiveness with you. Therefore, you shall be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits for him. In his word is my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, wait for the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy. With him there is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all their sins. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. As you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this matter I am giving my advice— it is appropriate for you who began last year not only to do something, but even to desire to do something. Now finish doing it, so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of a fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need, in order that there may be a fair balance. As it is written, the one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of a synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and she was no better, 
but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his cloth, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my cloth? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you? How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brothers of James. When they came to the house of a leader of a synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talita kum, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. Well, today we continue our journey in Mark's Gospel, a journey that is both geographical and spiritual. If the beginning of chapter 4 was dedicated to Jesus' teaching, the end of a chapter and chapter 5 are focused on Jesus' miracles. We see Jesus calming the storm, that's what we heard about last week. We see Jesus casting out demons, that's the beginning of chapter 5. We actually skip this passage in our lectionary. And today, we see Jesus' acts of healing that will actually result in a resurrection. And so after displaying his power in his teaching, Jesus displays his power over nature, demons, and as of today, power over disease and even over death. The structure of a passage we have is very typical of Mark's Gospel, with a story inside another story. Maybe Mark wrote this way to sort of insist on a point, or maybe, as we mentioned previously, the action in Mark's Gospel is so fast-paced that Jesus had to do two things at the same time. Or maybe a story sheds light on another story. They explain and complement each other. And actually, if you look at our characters today, it is certainly interesting to notice how they balance each other. Jairus and the bleeding woman seem to be complete opposites. Jairus, as a leader of a synagogue, is certainly a well-established man, well-known and respected, learned and religious, surrounded by family and friends. On the other way around, we read that the woman, uh, the bleeding woman, has spent all her money. What the story does not say, but Jesus' audience would know, is that the woman was considered impure. Nobody could touch her without making themselves impure as well. And so she was probably very lonely, unable to have children, probably divorced, and she had no access to most of the religious activities of her people, 
which could also explain their religiosity that almost falls in the category of superstition. If I but touch his clothes, I will be made well, so she thinks. And yet, yet in spite of all those opposition, there is something common to the leader of the synagogue and to the bleeding woman. They are both at their wit's end. They have exhausted all their resources. It is said plainly about the woman. As for Jairus, as a leader of a synagogue, you know, if he asks a wandering preacher most of his peers are suspicious about, it indicates clearly that he does not know, he does not know whom to turn to. And maybe saying that the two characters are the wit's end is putting it mildly. It seems that they are desperate. And so today, both of them, no matter how different, they both fall at Jesus' feet. Well, the first thing I would like to notice with you is that, according to Mark, both Jairus and the bleeding woman need Jesus in the same way, no more, no less. And it's interesting because we sometimes think that Jesus was only interested in helping the poor and the outcast. And he was certainly interested in helping them, don't get me wrong. But there's more than that. Jesus is interested in helping all those who can't help themselves, which means absolutely everybody, the rich and the poor, the educated and the uneducated, the religious and the non-religious. The only requirement is that they would acknowledge their need or rather that they would open their door, their heart to Jesus. And it wouldn't have been easy for both of our character. It wasn't easy for Jairus because he had to acknowledge that all his knowledge about God, his wisdom, his rights and his prayer couldn't save his own daughter. It wouldn't have been easy for the bleeding woman because she couldn't acknowledge her disease in front of a crowd and in front of the master. She was considered impure, remember? And she was probably ashamed too. You know, even today there is still a taboo around menstruation. You don't tell people about that, and especially not men. So I can't imagine how it was at the time. There is a simple reason why the woman does not ask Jesus to heal her and rather try to catch his clothes instead. She couldn't ask in front of everybody. She was ashamed of her body, or she knew people would make her feel this way. So I have two questions for us today uh, about the story. My first question is, do we acknowledge that all of us and all around us need Christ? And are we ready to make room for them? and to help them to have this faith encounter. Remember, in this section of the Gospel, Jesus is training his disciples, teaching them who he is and showing them what to do to be his witnesses. Jesus didn't heal people to make a statement, but he was making a statement all right. And the statement is that all need him, because in the end, no matter our social status, our wealth, our relationships, we still have times in our life when we feel or when we are broken, because we are at our wit's end when serious disease and death strike. Remember, Jesus does not prove himself only to be a healer, rather, he acts as a savior, and we noticed that last week. Jesus did not just calm the storm of a boat, what he did was rescuing his friends from a certain death. So do, how do we make it possible for others to get to know their savior? Well, that's a question we could ask ourselves as individuals and as a church. I am excited that at St. Margaret's we are going to launch a program for newcomers and all those who want to start afresh in the Christian faith. Like the bleeding woman, I am sure we often have visitors in our pews who are trying to touch Jesus' cloak, have a glimpse of him. 
people who don't feel so worthy, but who still are looking for a world of comfort, for meaning in their lives, for friendship and acceptance. And we should be ready to welcome them. I love it that Jesus does not just let the woman go away with a gift, but he's looking for her. He wants to engage with her, to let her know that she's noticed, and more than that, that she is loved and that she belongs. Notice that he calls her daughter. She is a daughter to him with the same love that the little girl is Jairus' daughter. He takes time with her, although he is on his way to an important man's place. But everybody is as important in Jesus' eyes. And so it should be the same for our churches as well and for each one of us. Now, my second uh, question is for each one of us more personally. As we noticed before, we see that in spite of all their differences, what's common to our two characters today is that they are being willing to open themselves to Jesus, to ask for help as Jairus or as the woman to tell the truth. To me, it's very interesting to notice that when Jesus praises the woman's faith, we often assume that he praises the fact that she touched her cloak to seek for healing. But I don't think this is what it's about. Jesus is not praising magic or superstition. Jesus praises the woman's faith after Mark tells us that although the woman is all fearful and trembling, she steps out of a crowd, fell down before Jesus and tell him the whole truth. She could have run away, but she chose to make herself known. And this is what faith is about. And this is what Jesus praises. We talked about faith last week. Jesus taught his disciples to have faith in the storm. And we said that faith was a good mix of trust, humility, and boldness. But what the, the gospel teaches us this week is that faith takes also a lot of vulnerability. And so my question for us today is, do we have this vulnerability? Do we engage in faith as a man of a synagogue who basically could live through faith as an occupation, a center of interest, or a way to have a social status? Do we engage faith as a woman of a street with a bit of superstition, a taste for mag magic, and a bit of drama? Or are we ready to be transformed in the faith of Jairus and the faith of a bleeding woman? Looking for a faith that will invite Jesus to really transform our lives. Are we ready to tell the whole truth about ourselves? To show Jesus who we are inside, our hurts, our sins, and mostly our powerlessness over our own destinies? And that leads us to the last point of the story. We need to take Jesus seriously. When Jesus arrives at Jairus' house, you know, he promises healing and resurrection to all. But we see that the friends and the family laugh at him. And so Jesus turns away from them. They don't get to witness the miracle. I don't think Jesus is trying to punish them by pushing them away out of a room. But it is said in other places in the gospel that sometimes Jesus couldn't do any miracle because of people's lack of faith. So he had to turn away from those people to be able to perform the healing and actually his greatest miracle, a resurrection. In the same way, Jesus cannot help us if we don't take him seriously by being plenty honest, vulnerable, trusting, and ready to let him do what he needs to do for us. Jesus turned away from those who didn't take him seriously, but he never turned away from those who came to him with their whole heart. And maybe that's all the faith we required to put in him. Amen. Let us confess our faith. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, 
true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things are made. For us and for salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified on Jehovah's Spirit. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to church the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the living God of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. We pray for Michael, our presiding bishop, our bishops Susan, Jennifer, and Porter, and for all bishops, for Fanny, our priest, and for all priests and deacons and all ministers of your church and for the congregations and clergy of St. Albans, Annandale, and St. Thomas, Richmond. Lord, in your mercy, guide the people of the land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. We pray for our President Joe, for our Governor Ralph, and for all leaders in this and every land, and for all the men and women of our armed forces and those working abroad and their families at home, especially Nick. Lord, in your mercy, give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. We pray for Mackenzie, Wally, Dave and Mikey, Kay, Betty, Jean, Renee, Mary and family, Renelle, Winston, Jimmy, Kathy, Nikki, Len, Jojo, John Richard, Barbara, Marion, Ivy, Sharon, Stephen, Ralph, Jim, Lou, Rich, David, Rosalina, and Catherine Knight, John and with the Weatherly family, Charlie, the family of Candace and Debbie and Mike Culkin. Lord, in your mercy, we commend to your mercy all who have died, especially Candace, that your will for them may be fulfilled and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy.
Almighty God, to whom all needs are known before we ask, help us to ask only what accords with your will, and those good things which we dare not, or in our blindness cannot ask, grant us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most, Most merciful God, God we, we confess that, that we have sinned against you in thought, in thought word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. We praise you and we bless you, holy and gracious God, source of life abundant. From before time you made ready the creation. Your spirit moved over the deep and brought all things into being, sun, moon and stars, earth, winds and waters, and every living thing. You made us in your image and taught us to walk in your ways, but we rebelled against you and wandered far away. And yet, as a mother cares for her children, you would not forget us. Time and again, you called us to live in the fullness of your love. And so this day, we join with saints and angels in the chorus of praise that rings through eternity, lifting our voices to magnify you as we sing. Holy, holy, holy God, Lord of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. Glory and honor and praise to you, holy and living God, to deliver us from the power of sin and death and to reveal the riches of your grace. You looked with favor upon Mary, your willing servant, that she might conceive and bear a son, Jesus, the holy child of God. Living among us, Jesus loved us. He broke bread with outcasts and sinners, healed the sick and proclaimed good news to the poor. He yearned to draw all the world to himself yet we were heedless of his call to walk in love. Then the time came for him to complete upon the cross the sacrifice of his life and to be glorified by you. 
On the night before he died for us, Jesus was at table with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again, he gave thanks to you, gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of a new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Now gather at your table, O God of all creation, and remembering Christ crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come, we offer to you our gifts of bread and wine and ourselves a living sacrifice. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the body and blood of Christ. Breathe your spirit over the whole earth and make us your new creation, the body of Christ given for the world you have made. In the fullness of time, bring us with St. Margaret and all your saints from every tribe and language and people and nation to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And now, as I said, Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. And we say together the act of spiritual reception. My, My Jesus, I believe, believe that you are present in the, in the blessed, blessed sacrament. sacrament. I, I love you above all things, and I desire you in my soul. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, come spiritually into my heart. As, as though you were already there, I embrace you and unite, unite myself wholly to you. Permit not that, that I should ever be separated from you. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. God, God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation. And you have united us with Christ and one another. And you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your Spirit, that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen.
take bitter lips away. Let me forgive as one forgive and bring me peace today. No me mind of Jesus and show Dispel the memories of guilt and bring me peace within. Fill me joy of Jesus, anxiety shall cease, and hands Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.